enjoyed our fellowship uh, a little while ago. It was great to be with you and get to talk to some more of you and get to know some of you. So that's very good. We appreciate your kind, your kind words and your, your friendship, uh, your, your smiles that you gave to me and my family uh, in our stay here. There was this juggler that was driving down the road. He was pulled over by a policeman. This policeman saw some machetes in the back of his car. He said, what do you got those machetes back there for? And the guy said, well, I'm a juggler. And the cop was a little doubtful. He goes, oh, really? Well, why don't you prove it for me? And so the guy stepped out of his car, and he took his machetes, and he started juggling right there on the side of the road. And one guy, as he was passing by, slowed down and looked at it, and he said to himself, you know, I, I'm glad I quit drinking because look at the test that they're giving now. <laughs> you know, the Bible has very little good to say about alcohol. Going all the way back to the, to the days of Noah and what happened to him and his family. The Mothers Against Drunk Driving say that drunk driving is still the number one cause of death upon our roadways. And it's about one person in every 50 minutes whose life is taken because of drunk driving. What does the Bible have to say about drinking, about any type of drinking, whether it be a little bit, whether it be a lot? We, we can look in scriptures, we can find that, that drunkenness is condemned. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, listed among some others, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Proverbs chapter 20 tells us that wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. So there's not really a lot of good that it has to say about drinking in general. However, there are some Christians that believe that you can drink a little bit just as long as you do not get drunk. And, you know, we could ask, what's the definition of drunk? People have different definitions of that. We're going to touch on that tonight. Is that right? Are they right? Is it okay to drink, and we may call it social drinking. That's what some people call it, where uh, you're not just, you know, drinking a whole lot to just be out of control and, and all that. You just have maybe one or, or two or, or three or whatever uh, social drinking is, is determined to be. Is, is that okay? I think that's something that we need to look at because I believe I, I've talked to some people that, well, it's okay for me to sit down after work and have a beer and relax. And, wh and what's wrong with that? Well, we want to know, don't we? We want to know, is it right or is it wrong? What does the Bible have to say about it? It's our authority, by the way. So we'll go to the Bible to look at that. If you have your Bibles, please be turning to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. This is the famous passage that many use to justify drinking alcohol and drinking socially. Uh, it's when Jesus turns the, the water to wine. We'll look at a few verses of that in just a moment, but before we do, I want to look at some verses in the Bible, and I'll have them up here on the, on the PowerPoint that you can read, that talk about wine in general. Because when we look at this argument of whether it's social drinking, is it okay to do or is it not okay to do, we need to understand what the Bible means when it's talking about wines when it's talking about alcoholic drinks or non-alcoholic drinks, for that matter. I want to share, share with you a few verses. One, I believe we already covered, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Whoever's led astray by wine, strong drink, is not wise. So the Bible condemns the consumption of it. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 15 says, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk that you may look on his nakedness. So the Bible condemns the consumption of it. It condemns the giving of it. The giving of it. That's important for us to note when we read John 2 here in just a moment. But then there's another passage in Psalms, chapter 104, verses 14 and 15. It says this, He, talking about God, He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man, that He may bring forth food from the earth, and wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. Okay, wait just a minute here. 
So we look in one passage, and it's not treated so favorably, but we look in this passage, and wine is considered the blessing of God. So what does that tell us? What does that tell us when we think about it a little bit? It means there's two different wines that are talked about in the Bible. There has to be, because in one instance it's condemned, but in another instance it's the blessing of God. So that means there has to be a difference in what the inspired text is telling us here about what is consumed. If, is it a blessing or is it a curse? You see, I don't know about around here, but in Middle Tennessee, if you use the word Coke, that could mean anything as far as a soft drink. It could be a Diet Coke. It could be a Mountain Dew. It could be whatever. Uh, it's a Coke. And so that's how we talk there. But, but we need to make sure that when we speak about wine in the Bible, what exactly, which kind of wine are, are, we, are we talking about? Because that makes a difference. It certainly makes a difference. And we need to be educated with our friends who say, well, it's, it's okay to drink because of this passage. And let's go to this passage and look at it. Well, we, we want to use the Bible for sure as our authority, but we want to make sure that we define our terms, that we understand exactly what the Bible is saying here. So you look over there in John chapter 2, and we know the story that Jesus and his disciples are there at a wedding in Canaan, and his mother Mary tells them that they have run out of wine. And he says, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And, but she thinks that you know, he, he may do something here, so she t tells the servants, whatever he says to do, you, you do it. And, and so he does. We look there in verse, verse 6. It says, Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. So if you do the math, that's anywhere between a 120 gallons and 180 gallons. And it says, Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. So we know about exactly how much is given here. And he said to them, draw out some now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And notice, he's going to make, he's going to make a statement that talks about two different kinds of wines here in his statement. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. So there was an inferior wine before, and there is a good wine now. So when we're looking at this, when we're studying this, we need to ask, all right, what's the difference? What's the difference between the good wine and the bad wine? I think some scriptures can give us some help in that. We look at Matthew chapter 9 and verse 7. 17, Jesus compares him being here to new wine. He says, nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins would break. The wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. He said this in the context of his disciples not being in a grieving mood, in a, in a fasting mood, because the bridegroom is with them. The bridegroom is with the children of the bride chamber, and it's like new wine being put into new wine skins. So new wine having to do with the coming of Jesus and new wine being something that Jesus produced there for those people to drink. He gave them something to drink. That ought to tell us something about the new wine. All right, well, what is the new wine? I want to I use some uh, some commentary on this, a commentary from Truth For Today commentary, a good commentary put out by the, by the Brotherhood and, um, and, so, and some other commentaries as well. But I, I, drew, I drew on this, on, on their knowledge, and, I, and this has helped me in my, in my sermon preparation, and I think I can be able to explain it to you as well. So what's, what's the difference in these here? Well, one commentator says that in the Bible times, there were three varieties of wines. There were fermented wines, and that's the alcoholic kind. That was the kind that was exposed to air and the sugars mixed after an aging process and it became alcoholic over time. And we know that wines, some wines in the Bible were alcoholic because the Bible says do not get drunk with wine. 
it could, some of it could uh, be intoxicating. But then there were also the new wine that is made from, uh, that is taken right from the grapes, grape seed or, or from the grape juice or from the, the cluster rather. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 18 says the new wine is in the cluster. So in other words, this wine has just come out of the grape and has not had the chance to age and therefore ferment and therefore become alcoholic. Do you see that there? The wine only becomes alcoholic when the fermentation process begins. And then there are the wines that are boiled. And what would that do? That would stop the fermentation process. So they would take the wines out, and if they were going to store them for a while, if they did not want them to be alcoholic, they would boil them, and that would stop the fermentation process, and then they would not be alcoholic. It would be prevented. So I think we need to ask the question, what did folks prefer back then? We know what folks prefer today. They, they prefer the alcoholic kind, don't they? But what about in the first century? What did people prefer? That's something important for us to know because we're reading of what these people drank. So what do they prefer? Well, we have some documents, some historical documents that tell us what people thought at that time. There was a gentleman by the name of Pliny the Elder, not to be confused with Pliny the Younger, his nephew. But Pliny the Elder said this, he said, wines are most beneficial when all their potency has been removed by the strainer. Talking about their alcoholic content. It's most beneficial then. Another gentleman, another philosopher named Plutarch. Maybe you've heard of Plutarch. He said, in like manner, the purging of wine takes from all its, or in like manner, purging of wine takes from it all the strength that inflames and enrages the mind and gives it instead thereof a mild and wholesome temper. That's what the people liked back then. They wanted the alcoholic content removed if it wasn't before or it not to be alcoholic. That was the most pleasing. You look at the gentleman in John chapter 2, that type of the wine was the most pleasing. Jesus gave new wine. There was no aging process. It was miraculous. He gave new wine. There was no alcoholic content in there. If there was, then Jesus uh, would have been guilty of what it said there in Habakkuk chapter 2, to, to give your neighbor drink. Jesus produced about 120 to 180 gallons of wine there. Could you imagine Jesus, the Son of God, giving alcohol, people something that could intoxicate people? and therefore forfeit their inheritance in the kingdom of God? No. He never sinned himself, and he certainly would not aid in anyone else sinning either. So the wine that Jesus made was new wine. There was no alcoholic content in it, and it was the good wine that they preferred. Now, I want to look at another scripture here that, that I've examined several times over the past several months. If you'll go to our, it was our scripture reading in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And look at verse 18 there. We'll go back and, and read some more, but look there at verse 18. He says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. What does this word mean, drunk? You see, a lot of people today... They get a, a thought in their mind that a person is drunk when he's just tottering and he might be nauseated and he's just out of control. A lot of people think that that's drunk. Well, what is it? What's the technical definition? Well, if you look back in the original language, which is what I studied here, looking at the word, the word drunk simply means to be intoxicated. To be intoxicated. What that means is when the physical and or the mental faculties are impaired in any way. That's intoxication. That's what Ephesians 5.18 says is drunk. So you may not have this picture in your mind of that person being drunk, but according to Scripture, according to the Word, this person is drunk if he is impaired in any way. Now, the, I believe in all states except with the exception of Utah the blood the legal limit for to drive 
the blood alcohol limit is 0.08. If you are at that or if you exceed that, you are guilty of a DUI. In Utah, it's 0.05. It's even less than that. Let me share with you something uh, that I uh, was able to get off uh, the internet, a re reputable site. It's called alcohol.org. They help people deal uh, with abusive situations in families caused by alcohol. So these people, they're on top of this, they're experts in this, and this is what they said here. They said 0.02% is the lowest level of, watch it, intoxication with some measurable impact on the brain and body. You will feel relaxed, experienced altered mood, feel a little warmer, and may make poor judgments. Yes or no, is that person impaired? He is, isn't he? Or she is. Make poor judgments. And the CDC, I don't have this up here, but the CDC says at 0.02%, the same percentage, that a, a person's vision is impacted. They cannot follow a fast-moving object the way they normally could. And also at 0.02%, the CDC says that it's very hard to multitask. Some of you may be good at multitasking. I, I'm not all the best at it. Um, but you're even more impaired, or, or you know, even if you're not the best, you, you, you're even worse if you're at 0.02% of alcohol. So there is the impairment. You can say at 0.02% there is intoxication. This, this website says it's the lowest level of intoxication with some measurable impact. So Ephesians 5 and verse 18, what does drunk mean? It means simply to be intoxicated. When are you intoxicated? 0.02% is the lowest measurable impact of when you're intoxicated. Now, some may say, well, it's different for different people, isn't it? You've got somebody that's a, a, a man who's uh, got more meat on his bones. He's a little bit heavier set. He will not be affected as soon as, as, a, as a man who's as skinny as a rail. And, and that's true. That is true. I want to share with you uh, another study here, and this is coming from, uh, excuse me if I'm making this, I apologize for that. Uh, this is done from the Loyola, Maryland University, and they did a study of what the blood alcohol content of people were when they would have one drink, and, and some more, and more drinks, but one drink, and one drink consists of either a 12-ounce bottle of beer or a 5-ounce glass of alcohol, all right? One drink. And I know this is, isn't pretty up here. I just took a picture with my phone. Um, but at 200 pounds, a man at 200 pounds, if he has one drink, you see that one and you go down? What's his blood alcohol level at? 0.022%. A 200-pound man, he is at 0.022% after one drink, one bottle of beer or one glass of wine. For the ladies, too, I don't have it up here, but a 150-pound woman, after one drink, she is at 0.034. So she is intoxicated as well. And so what does that tell us? Well, how do you find, define social drinking? Most people would say it's at least one drink, right? Maybe two and maybe three. But it's at least one drink. And so I want to share with you what a beloved preacher who has gone on to his reward Said W.D. Jeff Coat, some of you may have known him, he wrote a book called The Bible and Social Drinking, and he said this, if it is sinful to be drunk, and if persons who engage in social drinking are drunk, then it is sinful to engage in social drinking. That's pretty down to earth. That's pretty logical, isn't it? I believe we just proved the case that at 0.02%, one is intoxicated, and after one drink, one is above 0.02%. And therefore, social drinking, we want to answer the question, is it sinful? Then yes, it is. It is. And we, don't, we do not need to be, have any part of that whatsoever. And if we have family members or friends who disagree, let's show them this information. Let's, as we talked about this morning, let's reason with them from the Scriptures. And let's look at science. Let's look at what others have measured as well. All right, so what are we supposed to do as Christians then? Well, we're to be filled with the Spirit. There's a certain way that we're to walk. You look there in chapter 5 of Ephesians. There's a certain way that we are to walk. We're to walk in love as Christ also loved us. And it says there that he had given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice for a sweet-smelling aroma. 
What do you think of when you read those words, a sweet-smelling aroma? What does that mean? Well, if you look back in the Old Testament times and you look at the sacrifices that were made, you think about Noah when he came out of the ark. When he gave a sacrifice, it says there that it went up before God and it was a sweet-smelling aroma. It was an acceptable sacrifice, a pleasing sacrifice. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2 says, Jesus, his sacrifice was well-pleasing to God. That's what it means. And so we walk in love. We imitate our Lord. We live sacrificially. We, we imitate him in, in everything that he does. Chapter 4 and verse 32, we're to be like the Father, forgiving one another, even as, Christ, even as God in Christ forgave you. Instead of living in malice and, and hating one another. So we're to be, we're to be filled with the Spirit. We, we walk in love, but we also walk in the light. There in chapter 5 and verse 8. And what does that look like? It looks like a life that reveals goodness, according to the Bible. Righteousness and truth. A life that is lived rightly, according to God. And a life that is truthful. That's the fruit of the light. That's, that's the way you and I ought to be living today. And then we are to walk circumspectly there in chapter 5 and verse 15. Not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And then he would go right in to saying, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. All of this goes together in context here. We walk circumspectly or carefully making sure we understand how we walk and we're, we're supposed to understand the will of the Lord. So how do we do that? We, we redeem the time. So in the time that we have, we avoid anything that may cause us to not do the will of, the, of God or might forget what God's will is for us. And would drinking not be a part of that? Certainly it would. We want to avoid all of that. And so what do we do? Well, we be filled with the Spirit. We redeem the time. We don't know how much time that we have, do we? We don't. And so what do we do? What do we do? We, we want to make sure that we take every moment to understand the will of the Lord. And so we avoid drinking, but we're filled with the Spirit. What does that mean to be filled with the Spirit? That means that we are filled with the Spirit's teachings. The Spirit's teachings. We spoke about this this morning in the importance of Bible study and how we, it's important to, to love God. It's important to love His Word. How often do you study the Bible? How often are you filled with the Spirit? I suggest this, and this is my own suggestion. You may have a different uh, routine that you go through. But I suggest getting up in the mornings. That's when your mind is rested. If you can, maybe your schedule does not permit that. And you set aside some time before you get to anything else, and you do your Bible study there. And you get consistent on that. You, you just work out whatever plan you have, whether it's reading through the Old Testament, the New Testament, some of both. And get consistent in doing that. Have a plan to do that. I remember when I was in... Um, Night traffic court, not night court, but traffic court after I had a speeding ticket. You know, they allow you, when you have a speeding ticket, to go to, tra I believe it's called traffic court, and you can go through this, sit through a, a, a lectureship, basically is what it is, and you don't have to pay the fine. You don't have to pay the fee. And so, hey, I, w I wanted to do that, and it would also go easier on your insurance. Well, there's one thing that I remember that the teacher said that was profound for me. I was pretty young at the time. It was very simple, but it was profound. He said, ladies and gentlemen, if you would just get up 30 minutes earlier, you would not have to speed to work, and therefore you would not have a speeding ticket. That's very simple, isn't it? But it's very profound, too. We all have to, most of us have to get up and, and, and go to work. Hey, but, but you may say, well, preacher, it's easy for you. You get to, you, you know, you study for your sermons. You're already studying the Bible. No. I'll tell you what. If preachers are not studying on their own, separate from their sermon and lesson text, and the preacher really not growing as he should. He's, he's certainly going to benefit from his study, but he's not growing personally as he should. You, you're going to want a preacher who studies on his own, who puts in the time. If I'm asking you to put in the time, then you know I'm being hypocritical if I don't do it myself. And, and I'm not growing if I'm not doing that. I remember early when I was preaching, I thought, well, I just don't have time to study. I'll just study my text, and that'll be good enough. And it wasn't. 
It wasn't. I found out quick. I said, this, it's just not good. I've got to do the study, and I did that. So be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the teachings of God. Not the, superna- the, the Spirit is not going to supernaturally zap us and fill us with the Word. You know, it's, it's been said that the apostles worked by inspiration, but you and I, we work by perspiration. We have to put in the work. We have to put in the study. Study the Word of God. And, and what will happen? What will happen if we do that? Well, we, we keep reading there. When we're filled with the Spirit, we're, we're, we don't get drunk with wine, which is dissipation. That means a, a wastefulness, a wasteful living. That's what the prodigal son did. He, was, he spent his life in riotous living. He wasted everything. When a person starts drinking, he always thinks he has time to sober up. I've got time to sober up. Well, the Bible says here we are to redeem the time. We're to redeem the time. And we shouldn't take anything away from that that would prevent us from doing that. Redeeming the time. And so we speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. There's a, there's a teaching aspect to when you and I get together. And that's a, that's a way that, that we can learn and, and we can be filled with the Spirit when we are hearing the sermons, hearing the Word of God, and we are singing those songs. I heard a preacher say one time a while back, he asked the question, how often do you, when you're singing these songs, how often do you really meditate on the words and understand them? Or are you just singing, going through the motions sometimes? For instance, O oh, to be like thee. Well, that, that's a wonderful song, is it? Thy, O oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus thy perfect likeness to wear. He got to thinking, well, would I, would I gladly forfeit all of earth's treasures to be like Jesus? Do I, I'm singing it. Do I mean it? Certainly an excellent time when we all get together. And that's, that's the importance of, of gathering together like we are. It's so important. We encourage one another, but we can be built up in our teachings. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. A lot of people think that word is assembly. But it's not. It's assembling, isn't it, with an I-N-G? And so what's the assembling? Well, that's any time we assemble, isn't it? And, but, but some people say, well, that's the assembly, and so as long as I just come on Sunday mornings, well, that's good. I fulfilled the assembly. But that's not what it says. It says the assembling of ourselves together. So whenever we assemble, that's the assembling, and that's when we need to be together to help build one another up, to redeem that time, to make sure that we're not unwise but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so as you go down through the, the rest of Ephesians, you look, you look in the relationships that it talks about here, chapter 5, verse 22 and following, talks about the husband-wife relationship. How many marriages have been destroyed because of alcohol? Well, I think it's too many to name, isn't it? Maybe you know of somebody in your family that has gone through something like that. Maybe you've gone through that personally yourself. Alcohol, there's nothing... It, there's nothing good about al- alcohol today. It, it's it's uh, except for medicinal purposes. That's the Bible. Paul told Timothy that to take a little wine for your stomach, and instead of just water only, water wasn't the best back then. They used wine to help get out some of the bacteria, and so they would dilute it to keep it from becoming intoxicated in the in the in the first drink. You you could drink a lot of them and be intoxicated with water, but but if you Diluted it just right, one would not intoxicate you at, at that time. But other than medicinal purposes, there's nothing good that the Bible has to say about it. And then you keep going there, and you see children obey your parents in the Lord. That relationship, how many children despise their parents now because one or both are an alcoholic? Or vice versa. How, how about the, 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 the parents who grieve over the children who imbibe? in such wastefulness. And then what about the servant and master relationship? We could think of employer and employee. How many people have been fired because they engaged in alcohol? They, they, they imbibed in that drink. How many businesses have gone under? I know of a gentleman. He was excellent at what he did. I mean, if he was, when he was on his game, nobody was better than he But you know what? He ruined all that. He could have been at the top of his industry because he was that good. He was that talented. 
But he had a problem. He could not do, he couldn't go a day without drinking. It just, that's what he loved to do. And he suffered for it, and he's still suffering for it today. And I believe in some circles he is looked down upon because of the way that he acts. And that's because what alcohol does to him. And so people cannot justify social drinking by the scriptures. You just can't do it. There's no way you can do it. And we know that one drink can make you drunk. Studies show that. And the track record for consuming alcohol, there's just misery, torment, sin, and death. And so why would you and why would I ever, why would we, why would we even consider touching the stuff? We certainly should not do that. The, the Bible says that it's wrong. And so what should we do? We should be filled with the Spirit. People maybe drink to relax or think that it makes them feel good. But when you're filled with the Spirit, when you're filled with the knowledge of God's Word, that's the best life you can ever live. It is. There's nothing more fulfilling. You and I didn't have to worry about waking up in a jail cell this morning because we were out drinking last night and we drove. How'd you wake up this morning? Did you wake up with your family in a peaceful environment? Yes, the spirit-filled life is the best life that you and I could ever live. And that's what we need to be teaching people. A lot of people say it's the no-fun life. They don't know. They don't know this life, do they? They don't know it at all. It's the richest life that you and I could ever live. It's not without problems. It's not without struggles. We all go through those. Everybody does. But when we look back upon our lives, and I was just talking to a gentleman today, and I was thinking about my youth in the church. I look back upon those times with great memories. And I look back upon the men who helped teach me and inspire me. And I still have a great connection with some of those men. Some of them have gone on to the reward. But I look back on that with great memories. And I think if I would have been doing something different when I was a young person, where would I be today? Where would I be today? Jesus says to drink something else. Revelation 22 and verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Jesus says there's a better way, and indeed there certainly is. Social drinking is sin, and we should abstain from it wholeheartedly and teach others to do the same. Maybe there's someone here tonight that desires to come back to the Lord. Maybe it's not anything to do with alcohol. But maybe there's something in your life tonight that you need to, you've been thinking about. You know you need to do it. I want to help you decide to do that tonight. I, I want to help you decide, get it right tonight. Be at peace with God and be at peace with yourself. How can you do that? If you're a Christian, repent of your sin. Get out of that sin. Pray for forgiveness. Acts chapter 8 and verse 22. 1 John 1 and verse 9 says to confess your sins. If we do that, we know that we can have hope that he will forgive us of our sins. Maybe that's your situation. Maybe you just desire encouragement. Maybe you have not, you have not been fulfilled the way you want to in your walk with the Lord. How can we help you with that? We want, we want to help you with that. Uh, in meeting many of you today, I know that you want to make sure that everyone is going to heaven. You want to help them get there. And so what can you do? What can we help you with tonight? Can we just pray with you to encourage you? Or maybe there's someone here tonight that is yet to make that commitment to the Lord, that has yet decided to follow him. If that's your situation tonight, then we bid you to come. Come to him in repentance. Come to him confessing him as Lord, believing that he is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and being willing to be submitted, being willing to be baptized for the remission of your sins. And then you will be, have your sins washed away, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. If that's your situation, then we bid you please come as together we stand and as we sing.